we spent a lot of time together. There's no like secret um, thing or secret trick. I pretty much made us all spend so much time together. Adam Rapp has a house upstate in Bearsville and we would go on retreats, all seven of us and spend days there around every single one of our workshops between our lab and our out of town, our out of town and Broadway. The final one, our set design team came. And I think when you just break bread with people, you spend time with people, you start to say like, oh, we don't have lanes. The book writer can talk about the choreography. The choreographers can talk about the sound design. They can talk about the music. The more we all understand that it all belongs to all of us, the better the product. So before we get into this brilliant musical, I'd like to know when you first read S.E. Hinton's book and the impact it had on you at the time and the impact it has on you now. Who wants to start? Anybody can start. Okay. <laughs> Joshua. Uh, I, first, I first read the book um, in middle school in seventh grade. It was the first novel I ever read. I, I didn't like reading as a kid. I wanted to be outside and play. You know, but my English teacher, Miss Murphy, she she had us reading in school and I was glued to it. And I was so excited to read it. And it was meaningful for me because it's the first time I, I witnessed in page form rather, not in real life, but in page form, that white people could treat other white people the way I felt white people treated black people. Because greasers was synonymous with the N-word, with nigga to me. And I was like, oh man, like, yo, I understand them. I am a greaser. You know, and 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 I don't know if she wrote it with that intention, but it definitely landed for me in that way. And years later, for me to be in this show and at this juncture, in this role, you know, it, I, that's that's a deeper conversation, a longer conversation, but it's very meaningful and impactful for a plethora of reasons, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you, Josh Boone. It was also the first book that I ever read uh, in eighth grade. I was a kid with dyslexia. I was in special education. I was also in what's called like behavioral classes. So basically like I was a hard kid to handle in class. I would mimic my teachers and just creative brain. I should have been in performing arts school, but my parents didn't have the money. So The Outsiders was the first book I ever read because my teacher showed us the movie first and we all started making fun of it. And then once we settled into the plot, we realized the movie was about us. It was about misfit kids trying to be understood. And so it drew us in to then read the novel and we read it, we popcorn read the novel and we read it six times that year and it saved our lives. A lot of the kids that I read that book with are no longer on this earth. A lot of them didn't even make it to 21. So it's just surreal that I'm here with Donnie and Brody and Josh Boone who has a sort of similar upbringing to me. They're also both from North Carolina, like our families are both Virginia, from Virginia. Yeah, North roots in North Carolina. Yeah, roots in North Carolina, so it's just surreal, yeah. Um, I mean, this was all really thanks to my mom, actually. Um, she gave me the book to read when I was 14. Um, similar to, that, to them, it was kind of the first book that I ever sat down and could really focus on. Um, and I just remember it so distinctly. Like, I sat down in the science building uh, parallel to my um, performing arts center at my high school. And I just remember sitting down as a freshman and kind of felt like, really really scared like all the kids from my middle school had gone to a different school I had also moved to Georgia from Michigan when I was nine so I had always felt a little bit like a loner in a sense and I cracked open this book I was reading it on the floor of the science building and I just felt a really deep connection and understanding of the Curtis brothers and I was just like I feel like I know what the household's like I feel like I know who these people are and I also really feel like this kid like especially Pony Boy because he was an artist in growing up in places where that's maybe not, doesn't seem like the coolest thing to do. Um, especially like growing up in Michigan, like dirt road living, like that was like, that was just not something we really talked about was like artistic expression. And so to finally meet a Pony Boy character, I was just like, wow. So that's really how it happened. My mom and she was like obsessed with the movie when it came out. She wanted to marry all those, all the original <laughs> cast members. Yeah, she had uh, Tommy Howell and Matt Dillon and everybody up on her locker and she was pretty convinced that she was going to marry one of them. Um, <laughs> didn't happen. Uh, but she manifested a Curtis bro. So here we are. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how I, how I got started with it. The first copy I read was the annotated uh, copy of the book that she read first. So that was real special. But yeah. That's great. 
Well, Danya, for you, when did you first read it? So I read the musical before I read the book. I knew about the book and I knew about the film, but for some reason I didn't have it in school. And so even though I knew about it as a cultural touchstone, I never encountered it. So my first experience was listening to the music of Jamestown Revival and Justin Levine and reading the script. And then immediately afterwards I went and I read the book and I read it in one sitting, um, like any great play. And I remember getting to the moment of Johnny's letter when he says, tell Dally, I don't think he knows. And I just burst out sobbing. And it was a visceral experience for me. It like touched my teenage self really acutely. Um, but the musical brought me to the book. Interesting. Yeah. For the cast, you are all perfection in this musical. Talk about who you play and what these roles mean to you and what being a part of this musical means to you personally. Anybody can start. I feel like we're going down the line a little bit, you know, for whatever reason. Um, I, I play Dallas, Dally Winston in the show. Um, and uh, Brody's the reason I'm, I'm up here. I'm going to stick to the question. But just when he told me that they were looking for Dally specifically, and that the Greasers were multi-ethnic, I, you know, internally and artistically jumped. You know, I was like, ah, like, I don't really want to do a musical, but if I was going to do one, yeah. this role in this show would be that one. And um, for reasons of my, of my upbringing, I know so many Dallies in the world, and they're my family, and my friends, and society is, is crazy right now. And I am an intentional artist, and I, I was hoping and do hope that by stepping into the role and by giving and maybe making somebody feel to the point of transformation, maybe you'll see a black Dali go out into the world and recognize Dali and treat Dali a little better. You know, wh whoever it is in your life who you see that way. And um, that is my aim, if you will. I hope I've achieved it at least once. Um, the role means a lot. That's That's all I can say to it right now, yeah. yeah. I'm um, Scott Lakota Lynch. I played Johnny Cade in the show. Johnny means the world to me. I mean, I came off a show called Dear Evan Hansen where I played a funny character, which is great. That's one side of my personality. But in times, the industry tries to pinhole people into being one thing. And so when I auditioned for The Outsiders, I saw myself as 2-bit. And the director at the time was like, you're not 2-bit. I can look into your eyes and tell you right now, you're Johnny Cade. And the thing about that was I had a hard time admitting to myself that my childhood was hard. And I had forgotten about the outsiders as I was as an adult. So going back to Johnny, it sort of was cathartic to go, oh, it's it's normal to not have a perfect childhood. It's normal to come from houses like that and to be able to express yourself in that way and to not have to always make it funny. You can just unveil yourself to the world and it's that's a good thing. You can step out of the shadow. So Johnny taught me a lot about that and also just working with Danya Tamor, like the way that she works, it really opened me up, not only as an artist, but as a human being, because I'm a very shy person. So yeah, thank you, Danya. Beautiful. <laughs> What's up? I'm Brody Grant. I play Ponyboy Curtis. And Ponyboy is very special to me just because I think, I think in the show, um, he... He in, and in the book, he, he writes about his experience, right? And how he feels, even though he loves his group, he still feels alone because there's just a part of him that he can't share. And I think that that's what's brilliant about the book and the story, The Outsiders, is it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, Johnny Cade. It's not Pony Boy Curtis. It's not Dally Winston. It's The Outsiders, which covers everyone which covers Bob Sheldon covers Paul Cherry every single one of these characters feels the most outside of the outsiders which is so relatable um and so i don't know playing pony boy i've gotten to really dig into that and realize that and journal about that and i think one thing that's really special about it right now is that as i'm you know learning how to be an adult slowly slowly uh <laughs> But learning how to do that and learning how to handle things and learning how to handle my emotions, which is something I've never been great at, um, learning how to journal and stuff like that, it's, it's been really transformative because I realized that even though we're all so different, we all go through so many similar emotions. You know, we all feel things very, very deeply inside. Um, 
And that's not an easy thing to admit. That's what I love about these characters is that they all get a chance to expose, to expose, you know what I mean? Not laugh about it, not, not really say anything about it. Just say, this is how my life is. How, how are y'all doing? You know, how do you feel about it? It's one of the reasons I love great expectations um, is because it, it feels like that direct address to everyone here. Um, so I'm kind of going on a little bit of a tangent, but pony boy means a lot to me. That's all I can really say about that. <laughs> so, <Beautiful>. yeah. <laughs> and Donya, for you, the cast, like I said, is sensational. You must've seen so many actors for these roles. I'm not putting you on the spot and I know that they're here, but you know, <laughs> how many of you have seen the outsiders here in the house? <laughs> yeah. Well, for those of you who haven't, you've got to see this musical. This is like, it's such a beautiful, beautiful musical. And to watch all of you take on these roles. But for a, from a director's standpoint, what was it specifically that you looked for in these three that you said, this is this one, this is that one? Well, I would say that each of these three individuals announced themselves as the people to play the roles. And I think uh, a thing one must do as a director is be a very good listener and be a really sensitive observer of people. I remember when Sky auditioned, I had in my head a different actor entirely. It was when I was first coming to the project and I had a much different idea in my head of Johnny Cade and I didn't know Sky at all. And Sky auditioned and it, it was instantaneous. It was like, oh. That's his role. That's Johnny Cade. Um, Brody played Soda Pop in the first audition, in the first workshop of the piece. And when we were looking for Pony Boy, I had this like uh, sense memory of his first audition where he auditioned for both roles. At that time, we had already cast Pony Boy, so it wasn't, it didn't hit me in the same way. But then I remembered and I went back and I watched his first audition and I was like, he was there all the time. It was there right there. And then like Josh said, Brody was like, I think there's this guy you gotta see for Dally. I was like, well, who is he? Tell me about him. And he told me about him. I said, well, tell him to come in. And then Josh came in and I remember Adam Rapp, the book writer, you know, we all sit behind the table and we write notes and Adam Rapp just wrote, best Dally ever and slid the paper over. <laughs> Forgot my line. And there was, a moment, there was a moment in Josh's audition, which is in the show, a staging moment. And I'd never seen somebody take the material to like, take that material of Dally further than the page or follow where the page was gonna go if not interrupted. And Sky and Brody were both in Josh's audition because obviously the chemistry of these three characters is so important. And I remember the looks on their faces when he came in. And so that alchemy just popped off. And so I would say they all kind of made themselves known. Um, and so did the rest of the incredible cast of this show. Because this is an audition question. We have many actors in the house today and watching all over the world. You know, you guys are all young. You're starting your careers off. And I, I want to ask you, what is it like for you? Were you always good at auditions so far? What's, how, okay, let's talk about the voices that every actor has in their head, especially before you walk into a door and you never know what's going to be on the other side of that table when you come in. Where do you put those voices? How do you prep for a great audition? And how did you prep for like your final auditions for this musical? And like I said, you, you, don't have to stop, you don't have to start, Josh. You can go at the end if you want. I'm gonna go last this time. Yeah. <laughs> Sky, you wanna go? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I struggled horribly with auditions because yeah. as you know, I'm dyslexic. And a lot of times, if, you have an, if you're lucky enough to have an agent or a manager, you'll get that material maybe a day before, especially for television. And uh, it used to go in person for television a lot. So, and it was usually with a casting assistant. And they did not, they're not actors. They don't care, they just wanna, put you on tape and get you out the door. So I struggled for so long to the point where I had fear of auditions. I would literally tremble at the thought of an audition. But it got easier for me once I started auditioning for theater because actually I was a SAG member before I was an actor's equity member. I got my, SAG, I got my equity card doing Dear Evan Hansen. Um, that was the first equity job I ever worked. Um, so once I got into a, yeah, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> it's, it sounds like a flex, but uh, I just didn't know what was what and so, <laughs> Uh, once I got into that, those rooms, it was just easier to have people who were relatable behind the table, like someone like Danya or someone who was caring about the actor and wanted you to get the job rather than just a face. Yeah. So I started just like dearming myself and being like, this is like a date and we're dating. And if, and if the date works out, great, we'll go on another date. And if not, that's okay. There's no hard foul. Or like finding a $20 bill on the ground and I'm like, oh my God, 20 bucks. Then someone's like, it's mine. I'm, I'm not gonna be like, no, it's not. I'm gonna be like, oh, there you go. No problem, you know? Yeah. 
I love that a date. I've heard, I've heard of so many actors and I was like, I love that way yeah. to go into an audition. Yeah. Who wants to go next? You said you want to go last. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, well, I will say something audacious and it's, it's kind of semi quoting Kobe Bryant, but he says that failure just isn't really real. You know, either way, you can let it define you. You can let it weigh on you. You can let not getting the job or not winning the game, you can let it define you. And you can say, oh, well, that's my, that's my year defining game or audition or whatever. But there's just, if you choose to keep going, if you choose to keep finding the thing that's right for you, if you choose to keep uh, being an artist, you know, and, and chasing after the story, the genuine story you want to tell, um, there, there's no, there's no such thing as failure, you know, all that pressure and stuff, all that negativity, um, you know, it, it will happen and it will pass, you know, but you just have to trust that. Um, I think that, um, to be honest, like even in the show that we're doing right now, I still have moments where I'm like, I didn't do that that great. You know what I mean? I still have moments where I'm just like, was that my best? No, but I get to try again tomorrow. Yeah. You know, that's the beautiful thing. There's no such thing as, as failing in this. It's the same thing with auditions. There were so many auditions, so many close calls that I was just like, well, that's it. Right before The Outsiders, I was actually pretty set on like, all right, I'm not doing musicals anymore. I'm not doing this. I'm going to do independent music and I'm going to try and be in movies. That's what I'm going to do. And then The Outsiders was, was the last like musical that I auditioned for. I was like, you know what? This is something I genuinely really, really want to do. Like Josh was saying, if there's a musical I want to do, it's this one. We'll see how it goes. And that's how it happened. And I went in with not, not expecting failure, not expecting a win, but just like a, I know that this is the story I want to tell, right? As, as an artist, not just as an actor. And that, that took off a lot of pressure. Um, again, I'm rambling. That's kind of what I do. Um, <laughs> But I also do want to say for anyone out there who is thinking about not even just an audition, but like a job interview or anything, you know, nervousness is actually the same sensation in your body as excitement. So it's just all about reframing how you look at it. That's that's what I tell anyone about auditions. It's just like, yeah, you feel nervous. Good. Like use that. You just have to change how you look at it. You can look at it with a frown, with fear, or you can look at it with like a, oh, yeah, that's a challenge and I'm willing to accept it and take it. So, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that I am maybe the rare actor who actually loves auditioning. And that's for a variety of reasons. Um, one, I'm a black man in the business. You know, I'm, I'm the oldest cast member for the first time in my career. I've, this is my fourth Broadway show. Um, that's a blessing to say fourth. Um, and I'm the, old, I'm the oldest cast member and maybe the more experienced one in, in the cast because of my longevity and or tenure at this juncture. Um, <laughs> but I've always loved auditioning because that was my opportunity to show somebody what I could do. Yeah. You know, whether you were going to cast me or not, my job being that sometimes I didn't feel like I was going to get the job because of optics or whatever it is, you know, the resumes, experience, the look. You never know why you won't get a job. But my job then is to make you make sure you never forget what I gave you that day. Like, you, if, I, if you give me the opportunity in that room, my only goal, and I used to use this vernacular, if you will, so bear with me, it's kind of violent. Um, my job was to go into the room and smack the creative team across the face with what I had to give that day. I don't want you to ever forget it. And at least twice it's happened. You know, I've had directors years later come to me and say, I'll never forget the first time you auditioned for me. And, and this is, is a blessing to recognize that the energy that I, I desired to walk into the room with, they, they felt, yeah, I carried a chip because the opportunities weren't in abundance. I moved from Virginia up here. Like Dali, I moved around a fair amount. I went to three different middle schools. So the one thing I have failed at in life, which is a blessing, I failed at conforming. You know, I, I it's me, you gonna get me. And I'm not trying to change anything. I just want to be, if nothing else, accepted. You know, my humanity to be accepted. So when I walk into the, outsider's room, and this is the, the beauty of it. Like I, I've been doing plays, my last musical was 10 years ago, 
And when Brody gave the word and I got the side, first of all, I know Danya from plays. I seen her work in plays. So when I saw her name, I was like, ooh. Like, <laughs> and then I saw Adam Rapp's name, who I know from plays. I'm like, whoa, 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 what's going on? And then I saw the material and Dally had a monologue. And I was like, this is my psychology. I was like, wait. There's a monologue in this musical? I don't think I've ever seen somebody have a monologue in a musical. And I was like, I do plays. Like, you gonna give me a monologue in a musical? I'm gonna make sure they never forget what I do with this material. And, and I wanted that energy and, and I was grateful for all of what was written. That, that's, that's, those are our, our, our jewels, the material, you know, we have to treat them as such, you know, and excavate and mine as much as possible out of the material. Don't, you know, bring yourself to it. You know, don't try to anticipate, I've done it many times, trying to anticipate what they might want to see. Right. Nah, give them something they could never expect. And and I hope I did that a little bit. I guess I'm up here, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, that's, that's a lot of my uh, intentionality behind auditioning. It's my opportunity to give somebody the work, even when I'm not getting paid to do it, and I'm grateful for it. Yeah. Beautifully said. <laughs> it's great how everybody has different ways they look at how to audition. Now, this is your first Broadway musical, and it's your first musical that you've directed, right? This is, the, this is it. <laughs> Flex. We've all fallen in love with her as a director of plays, but I'm fascinated by this whole thing. I mean, did you look at it differently to direct a musical than the way you direct a play? Or is it sort of the same thing? Well, first I'll say that that fact used to be a uh, liability. <laughs> She's never done a musical, she doesn't know. And now it's kind of like a flex. Yeah. And so I think it is important to remember when somebody makes you feel like something's a liability in you or a weakness or something you don't have, that that thing could then become your greatest strength or something very impressive or something you can that makes you different or unique. And so that's something I hold on to with this. Not like, oh, I'm so great, it's my first one, but that used to be something that made people nervous. And now it's like, oh, it's cool. So I, I think initially I approached it like I would any great piece of writing to talk like about what Josh was saying. I think what became how I worked on it differently is I began to learn about the musical as a form. And musicals were my first way into the theater as they are for so many. And then I never did them. Not really because of choice, they just didn't choose me. Um, and so something I learned about musicals is that you have a lot more high level collaborators than on a play. When I'm doing a new play, it's me and the playwright and then the company of actors, like we're, we're digging together. And on a musical, you've got the book writer, composers, choreographers. You have so many more people who are all working towards the shared vision. And that for me was astonishing, amazing, and so much more power to harness towards one common goal. So I fell in love with that. So the, the size and scope of the musical is much larger than any play I've been a part of. And then one collaborator in particular, Justin Levine, who is one of the co-composers, and he's also a co-book writer, he knows this form inside and out. And he, it's not that he is, you know, um, has any rules about it, but he allowed me to give the form respect. I think when I was first starting, I was like, let's call it a play, let's call it a play. I don't want to call it a musical, it's not a musical. And I looked down on the form, and I remember profoundly a phone call I had with Justin very early on in our first lab, where he said, I know we think it's cool to call it our play, but it's a bleep musical. <laughs> And it really stuck with me because I was like, yeah, why am I thinking I'm better than this? How dare I actually? And that moment allowed me to be really curious about the power of the musical. Why do so many people love it? Why does it have such, why is it so impactful? How can we subvert things that have been done, but how can we also learn from what's been done before? So I don't think I made a choice to approach it differently, but it taught me what it wanted. Like all the plays I've worked on teach you what they want you to do to them. If you try to do the same thing, yeah. it, it won't work. I love that. <laughs> this musical is unlike any other, and what a creative team like you just started on. Talk to me, Danya, about collaborating with book writer Adam Rapp, Jamestown Revival, Justin Levine, and your choreographers. Another shout out to Rick and Jeff Kupperman, I mean. Yeah. Talk about the collaboration working with them on this. Yeah, it's an amazing collaboration. So Rick and Jeff Kupperman, the choreographers, are brothers. They grew up fighting together and dancing together. They're 13 months apart. Um, I like to say I'm the third Cooperman brother. I'm the oldest Cooperman brother. 
I'm the tiebreaker. Um, but there, there are so many people on this creative team who are also directors. I think many people who are actors in this company are also directors. So I say that because it's a good thing. You've got a lot of people looking at the whole, not just their little part in it. And so working with this group of creators, I really wanted us to be able to work in a way where the theatrical language feels like one voice. You can't tell what's me. You can't tell what's the Coopermans. You can't tell where the transition is between the book and the songs. They should just all feel like one. Pony Boy should sound the same when he's talking as when he's singing. It's the same voice. And so we spent a lot of time together. There's no like secret um, thing or secret thing trick, I pretty much made us all spend so much time together. Adam Rapp has a house upstate in Bearsville, and we would go on retreats, all seven of us, and spend days there around every single one of our workshops, between our lab and our out of town, our out of town and Broadway. The final one, our set design team came, and I think when you just break bread with people, you spend time with people, you start to say like, oh, we don't have lanes. The book writer can talk about the choreography. The choreographers can talk about the sound design. They can talk about the music. The more we all understand that it all belongs to all of us, the better the product. And I feel that way with the ensemble of actors as well. I want them to feel ownership. I want them to feel like they've had a hand in creating it because if they feel like it's theirs, then they can really own it, you know? I think when you see the show, you see 16 people who are owning it and they're confident and they're vulnerable and they expose themselves. And I think that's because they have buy-in and they, and they have created it too. So I think all members of the creative team really let their egos aside and chose to fuse together towards this shared vision. That's why I think this show is seamless. And that's the hardest thing to do, and it's the hardest thing for a director to do, is put all these pieces together to make a perfect musical or a perfect cake. And when you said about just you know letting all egos aside and sitting up there and doing all this stuff, that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. I love this score. Just so you know, the album is now out. So if you can download this album, it's one of the best al cast albums. Check it out. Check Go it out. Check Run it, it out. up. Run it up. <laughs> Run it up. You know. So, um, for the cast, there's nothing like putting together a brand new musical. Talk to me about you three collaborating with this team. What it was like for each of you. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. F I was a I was a, a late addition, if you will. They had done the production in La Jolla, yeah. And I came through. I came in through Brody and Diane. And I had a, a conversation before I did a workshop last summer, and yeah, uh, dang, I feel like let me truncate this because I now realize it could be a book. And um, <laughs> what I'll say is, I'm only gonna speak through about her and my experience through her. Yeah. When we had that conversation, you know, I felt like I found my director, you know, yeah. somebody who cared about the work, who had a willing ear. I don't know how she gives ear to the amount of people that she does, but it's, it's always like you can at least speak to her and share your thoughts. You know, she may not take anything that you say or, you know, agree with much of what you say, but there are moments where she's like, huh, let's, we have to explore that. We have to check that out. Let's try it becomes her vernacular. Let's just see, you know, a, a real collaborator. And and it, it, I get to walk into the room with ease knowing that at least I can speak my mind, you know. And it doesn't mean that, you know, I, 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 um, I do have strong opinions, you know, and I am... I want my humanity to be respected first and foremost above anything, you know, in regards to this business. And I feel like she was fully accepting of both of them. Doesn't mean we didn't have our run-ins, you know, our moments where we were at odds. But even in, in that, the amount of grace that she's given me has taught me how to go out into the world and be as gracious as her, you know, in all of my angst or frustration and or joy and excitement. She She's helped me focus it a little more through my experience with her and and the rest of the creative team were an offshoot of that because she is undoubtedly at the helm of all of what you see and it's a blessing to be in, in the room with her if you ever get that opportunity take it that's all i'll say i love you i love you no what, what, what josh is saying is so true like i've never i realized i've never had a collaborator before that was on a higher end of the totem pole. Um, I've usually had directors tell me where to stand, how to turn my head and how to say the line and how to hit the periods. And so when I go home, I feel like a shell. You know, I was like, oh, am I 
good or am I just doing someone else's show? So when I got to work with Danya Tamor, the number one thing that stuck out to me was how much table work we did. And it's not even like, let's read the scene. It's sort of just like, let's sit there and talk about what this is about, you know, as a collective. And like, for example, like the Johnny Daly scene, for those who have seen the show, I once had someone tell me, oh, that little scene, that's such a stupid little scene. Like, it's easy. I'm like, is it? Or is it one of the more important scenes in the show? Because it's not about a chocolate bar, I'll tell you that much. It's about the silence in between the chocolate bar that then leads to a certain item that is important to our show. So it's fleshing out moments like that so that when me and Josh are on the stage, we know what's going on. And it's the audience's job to lean in and figure out what it is, you know? And that's what I think art truly is at its best form. Um, so yeah, I just, I think I found my collective finally in my life. I've been looking for it for a long time and I'm grateful that Danya brought me in the fold. <laughs> What I have to say about working on the outsiders, like holistically, actually, uh, with the creative team, I think can actually be captured in a statement by Susie Hinton, who wrote the original novel. Uh, when we did our out of town, we did a Zoom with her, like, I think the very first day, right? And one thing that she said to us was, I don't want, like, I don't, I don't want y'all to go and do, see, see Thomas Howell's Pony Boy and put that on stage. I don't want you to do Machio's Johnny and put that on stage, no. I want y'all to fuse with the characters, like become one, like this. Um, it's, it's something you sort of touched on in a way when you're talking about auditioning, you know, not, not going in and trying to give them what they want, but rather bringing all of you to it. You know what I mean? And I think that our creative team has allowed us to do that in a way that is really, really, just nutritious it's just amazing um because like i don't know it's 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 true I, when, when i go home I, I don't feel like a show you know i feel like i really actually got to bring a piece of myself to the story every 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 single day um and i think our creative team has worked tirelessly to make that so you know uh this one here especially um so yeah, I mean, it's it's been a really beautiful, beautiful experience, and it's taught me a lot about acting, actually. So, yeah. I, I, and I want to add to it. I just got to Go say, forgive me. This is part of my, look, that, the creative team, they're aliens, yo. Like, Diane Tamor is an alien. Justin Levine, I'm <laughs> telling you. Like, if y'all ain't believe in aliens before, if you get in the room with this guy, the, the, the it's just, I've never experienced anything like it. Adam Rapp, like... They knew before I knew, so I was often in the process, mouth drop, like at, is in awe of, I, I don't have words. I'm gonna have to write a book at some point about it. But it's, it's, it's a, they're different. It's different with them, you know? Uh, it's just, it's, it's, that's all like, I didn't say nothing. But it's a aliens. different level of collab. It's a different level of art, <laughs> yeah. It is. It's a different level of collaboration, and I think it's it's really exciting because we, as actors, get to be a part of something that feels like this is this is a great this is a, a great uh, way of doing things for for art as a whole. So yeah, UFOs, bro. Totally. UFOs. I love it. Now, Donda, did you get to spend time with Susie Hinton? What was that like? Um, what kind of conversations did you have with her? Amazing conversation. So we, I went for the first time to Tulsa two years ago this summer, and I went with uh, the choreographers and Justin Levine and one of our set designers and two of the producers who are here. And it was an amazing experience. I was really nervous at first to meet Susie. She wrote this incredible book. It's so pure. It's so um, audacious and brutal. And I... I vibed with her though immediately. It was her birthday when we met and we went to this restaurant and we all had lunch and she loves martinis and she had one. And the guitar player started playing this song, El Paso, and it's her favorite song. And uh, the only two people who knew all the words were me and Susie Hinton. And we sang it together and I was like, okay, we're good. This is, we, we, share, some, we share some DNA. And I asked her a lot of questions. I asked her just questions about the world. I, I love to read everything a writer has written. So I read all her other books and they're, 
She's so interested in some, so many of the same subjects, brothers, family, absent parents, um, animals. So I talked a lot about her world in general and then also about Tulsa. And like what Brody was saying, when I sat there with her that first trip, she said, have a vision, do your vision. You've got the story, you have the characters, but go on, have a vision. And for the person who wrote the book to give you that permission, and actually not even permission, but to say, go on, do it, yeah. meant the world to me. Then we got to go back with the actors. That was incredible. That was amazing. Susie Hinton loves actors. She has so much respect for them. She loves them. That's kind of her happy place. So to see her around them, hear the questions that they asked was amazing. And then just being in Tulsa in general deeply influenced the piece. It influenced the set design, uh, the feeling of the show, the sound design. Um, so I don't think we would have the show we have now Definitely, if we hadn't met Susie, but also if we hadn't gone and experienced Tulsa itself. Wow. What about you guys meeting Susie? What was that like? You went on your birthday. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so after we did our out of town, um, I actually had to get surgery because, oh, this is kind of a tangent, but <laughs> I tore my ACL on like the fourth day of rehearsal in La Jolla and it was really, really scary. But this is also a testament to the creative team and the producers, first of all, because let me just, let me just cheer them on for a second. So I tore my ACL and I was like, oh no, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this. And they were like, no, Brody, we're going to make this work. We're going to make this work. And they trusted me. They believed in me. They made sure I got the right PT. And I was able to do the show with some some slight adjustments. My track was a lot less physical than it is now on Broadway because now I, now I got two of these guys. Um, <clears throat> but right after we finished in La Jolla, I got my surgery in California. And so I wasn't able to move back to New York because um, you have to walk a lot in New York to live there. So I was like, maybe I should not do that. And so I kind of just stayed in my hometown. It's like I stayed in Georgia. I stayed in Michigan with family uh, in that in-between time. And I was really bored <laughs> and uh, I was just doing PT and stuff like that. And then I was like, what, what do I do for my birthday? How can I like give myself something that would be nice? And then I was like, wait a second, I really should, I should take a week in Tulsa and just like fly out there, stay on the East side and just wander. And so I went and did that, talked to the producers, they hooked it up so that way I could get lunch with Susie and talk to her and just get to know her. Um, and this brings us to the actual question. <laughs> so, I got to sit at lunch with her and talk with her and just kind of have a martini. <laughs> um, it was amazing because what she says about Pony Boy is that he is her most unfiltered when she's writing as Pony Boy. Um, it's just raw, unfiltered. It's just her. So obviously, getting to talk to the person that she is, you know, was very, very, very helpful for me. And she's very generous too. Um, she's no BS. You know, she suffers no fools. She's straight up, which I really, really like. She's a very honest person. Um, and I think that comes through in her characters. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was just, a, it's it's a really beautiful thing to get to do that. I mean, it's not it's not often that actors get to, get to meet and spend real time with... Um, you know, the writer of the OG source material that's been around for 50 plus years. Um, so it was definitely a gift, a blessing, and I'm, um, wow. Yeah, it's it's pretty surreal. Um, and what was really cool was getting to introduce my mom to her uh, at opening night uh, <laughs> uh, at Broadway. That was a real special treat, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's awesome. It's so awesome. Uh, I think Tulsa like changed me as a human being, honestly, like of course my performance, but like it cracked me open in a, such an odd way because it's like the slowest city, but also like the most welcoming city. When we went there, we went to like a two-step bar and like it just taught me so much about where like Johnny's from and where Pony's from. And then getting to actually have lunch with Susie Hinton and ask her like, why Johnny? You know, like, what made you write this character? And she said that she saw some kid in her high school who looked like Johnny Kate, and she just invented this whole backstory for this character off of just the way this kid looked. And then the first time I ever heard Stay Gold, I'm a person who does not like to listen to my own voice at all. Um, I heard Stay Gold for the first time at Will Rogers High School where she wrote The Outsiders. And it's also special to me because I'm also indigenous, and there's a lot of indigenous kids that go to that school. So it was like so serendipitous and just it, it really cracked me open as a human being. Yeah. Um, you got to understand that 
Outsiders was not only the first novel I read, but because it was the first and it got me, it was my favorite novel until I read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So the question then becomes like, how would you feel if you met the author of your favorite book, yeah. you know, the first book and your favorite book for, for some time? And is, you know, there are no words to that. I think in the meeting process, because I care about people most, was to learn how much she cares about people, how bold she is, how audacious she is. Those are the things that ping, you know, and how she's in service to humanity through the work. That's what I cared about the most. And I'm gonna take a quick detour because sometimes we reference producers and we tighten those producers because they're the money people. But I, like Danya said, our, our lead producer is here. Matthew Rigo is here. And this man has so much heart, yep. you know. I have to say that, you know, like, you, you feel the love and care throughout all of it. Yeah, he got his way, you know, Diane got her, everybody got their way, but he cares, you know, and that means so much. And don't ever let the dollar tighten your heart, you know, and, and I, I keep telling him that, because I hope we can the, the success keeps going up, you know, and this guy gets everything that he wants, and we do too, you know. I just want to put that out there, you know, in the answer real quick. Beautiful, thank you for that. For the actors, what is it like seeing this beautiful and eclectic score? One of the most beautiful scores I think has ever been written for a musical. It's a gift because it's like getting to sing Frank Ocean, The Lumineers, Bill Withers, Bob Dylan all at once. <laughs> 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 That's all I'll say about that. Next. <laughs> It, it's a it's a score that I'm not scared of singing. That's for sure. And like I'm a person who's not like a singer first. So like to get to like just open up my heart chakra and do something like stay gold with Brody. It's like means the world to me. It's not often that I get to do something like that. So yeah. I look. I'm. I don't know how to read music. I know that when the notes go up, the the I'm supposed to go up when I go down, <laughs> right? So so this is Justin Levine though. You know. I learned all the music by ear, like in church, in youth choir in church. Like he literally just played the music and s told me how it was, you know, how it was sung. And that's how it stuck. That way I don't see notes and lines in my head while I'm doing the music. It's, it's helped me a lot. But you gotta understand, like all those artists that Brody named, Justin will literally, while he's teaching you the music, go off and <laughs> sing just like them. He'll like, oh, this is inspired by this. And he'll play a Bob Dylan song or a Stevie song. And it's, it's, ah. I would come from a session with Justin. I would walk into the room screaming to everybody like, yo, do y'all know who this guy is? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we know. And I'm just like, you know, you can feel my excitement because it's so, I'm telling y'all, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. I'm trying to. For real, man. What are we talking about right now? Yeah. That's another thing I just I want to I want to go off of that. You you mentioned something, doing this show and singing this music as a church choir kid. That's like that was all I did in high school. Was like if I wasn't at at my high school like working on the musical, I was at church choir like just doing all that stuff, and it I f find it I don't think there's a coincidence or I think it's a God thing really that like this show takes place in a church at some parts. It feels like we get to sing. It feels like church, yeah. low key, and that's a really, really beautiful thing. It, that's 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 bigger than just notes on a page. That's like we get to sing from our hearts. It's yeah, a beautiful thing. and I would say also Justin and John and Zach of Jamestown. I think this is a really humble thing to do, uh, even though it gets the best result. They say when you sing it, I want you to sing it like you wrote it. I want it to feel like you wrote the song. And so their openness to also meet each singer where they are and to then, you know, because it's a new musical, to hone the music to each of these instruments and these artists that are seated here, that's really special. And that, you know, Brody's singing as Ponyboy, but he's using his voice. This guy's using his voice. Josh is using his voice, so there's no distance between. And I think that's part of why it's so felt and why the voices are all so unique. And when the understudies go on, they don't sound like them, they sound like them. And we are trying to encourage that so that you're getting a truly felt experience rather than like Sky was saying like, oh, I'm a, I'm doing somebody else's performance. Part They're the doing their, yeah. their own performance. And the music is malleable to a sense to accommodate the truth of any performer who is the vessel for it. And I, I think that's a testament to Justin and John and Zach and the whole way the creative team has tried to build the piece.
Thank you, Zanya. Yeah. Danya, because all three yeah. of them said exactly what, that, like, they gave us that. And that's a gift, you know, having been stuck in situations where this is what it is, this is what it is. Like, no, what do you think? How does it feel? All three of them, Zach, John, and Justin. And that, thank you for saying that, because uh, as an artist, you want to feel free to create, not restricted in the creative process. And Danya, all the way through, cater to that, to freedom as an artist in the process. That's the other great thing about this musical. I mean, usually in musicals, you fill a track. You listen to people, oh, I'm doing the track. I'm doing the Pony Boy track. I'm doing this track or whatever. But you are these people. You really are these people. When you go to see The Outsiders, you know, you're seeing him. That's Pony Boy. You know, it, that's the great thing about this, right? The freedom you've given them. Yes, one of my favorite sequences oh. is the drive-in. Uh, it's full companies on stage except for uh, the two older brothers. And the other night, it's not a sad part of the play. The other night I was watching it and I was just crying. <laughs> I was crying tears of joy because the life that these performers are putting in. Yeah. Like there's so many different little real specific grounded details that you can hold on to that don't distract from the A story. But if your eye wanders, nobody is phoning this in. Yeah. Everybody is mining a true, real experience on stage. And I literally wept <laughs> tears of joy and pride when I watched it the other night. So I was gonna ask you guys, what is your favorite part of the show or one of your favorite parts of the show that you don't do that one of your other guys here on stage does? I love the soda pop uh, pony boy scene yeah. on the car. It's just so sweet and funny. Jason Schmidt is also just like one of the sweetest people in the world too. So like when you know Jason, you know Brody, it's like that's just them being them, which is like all you want in a play is like people just like disarmed, you know? It's either, it's, it's my favorite song is Thrown in the Towel. Oh. And... Like, oh gosh, what I would give to just you try, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would, it would, it's either throwing in the towel or the or the fountain yeah. stabbing. One of those two moments I would love to be a part of. Nice, throwing in the towel. Let's go with that. Let's keep it. You know. <laughs> so good. This is really, really hard. <laughs> this is really hard. Um, I, I think. I don't know. It's kind of interesting because I still feel a part of it as the watcher, but like watching y'all do the the scene where it's just Johnny and Dally in front of Johnny's house. It's just a beautiful scene. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't be able to do it as good, but I just watch it. I get, I get to watch it every night and I'm always like, dang, I'm in good freaking company. Like I'm blessed to be here. That's for sure. So that's all I can say. And then maybe... I don't know. Run Run Brother Slaps. It's, it's a great song. That song gets in my head all the time. So maybe singing the hook. Yeah, maybe that. I don't know. It's a lot. Dying. Yeah, what you see what's your go to? Fountain <laughs> stabbing. The fountain. other night I was backstage uh, for the first time while the show was happening. I was doing an interview and I came down and I saw the actors backstage while the show was going on. Sky was one of them. I was like, oh. And they're like, come on with us. They're like, <laughs> <laughs> it was about to be the breakup scene and they're like walk on with us um, <laughs> um yeah so i don't know i don't know what part i would want to do i'd have to think about that <laughs> she's good <laughs> you know what i what, looking at this this is a book that's written by a woman it's directed by an incredible woman. It's about boys and men and a whole other thing. What was it like for you to put your, you know, your senses and everything into this, being a woman? Well, I think that this book about masculinity only can exist because it was not written by a woman, it was written by a girl. It was written yeah. by a 15 year old. And so I think that's amazing. And she looked around and she was like, this isn't fair. Why do people treat these people like this? This isn't fair, I don't like it. I'm pissed, I'm gonna do something about it. And it comes from that sort of feeling. And that feeling is something that I feel often. It's something that I can remember feeling when I was that age. I also think something that's amazing about her gaze, and I don't think you have to be a girl or a woman to have a feminine gaze. I think anybody can have a feminine gaze. But she has so much compassion for the characters and she shows them in all their facets. So in their anger, their rage, their cowardice, their guilt, but also their softness, their beauty, their sweetness, their tenderness. And I think she sees them in a way that they can't even see themselves. 
And so when I was creating the room uh, in which we would make this, I tried to make an atmosphere for the actors as well because I really see them, I really love them, and I want them to be able to bring all their qualities both into the space as artists and then also to the roles. So I don't know if that's because I'm a woman. I think it's something I'm interested in as an artist, and I think it's feminine, perhaps, whether that has anything to do with gender or sex, I don't really know. Um, but it's just about making space for it to happen. I think Susie Hinton in the book makes space for these boys to be yeah. and for us to really see them. Like I love in the book, she's like, <laughs> she's talking as Pony Boy, but she's like, my brother's so cute. He's got these eyes like this and like that. Um, but that, that was something that she saw, you know? Um, and yeah, I just tried to give us the space to really allow those things to come. So like we would do long warm ups, we would spend a lot of time excavating, learning about each other. We would do an exercise called mirroring, which maybe many of you have done where you, the only rule is like you have to keep eye contact with your partner. And we would do one every time called the divine feminine. And it's a great day of rehearsal. Great day of rehearsal that starts with the divine feminine mirror and just allowing them to explore their everything, which I think is part of what Susie Hinton did. Yeah, so I was gonna ask you, was there something specific that unlocked this musical for you as a director? It might've been a lot of things, but was there a big specific thing that might've then set you on your path between like La Jolla's production and Broadway? I mean, the thing that unlocked the musical for me was that she, it reminds me of Romeo and Juliet. When I see a great production of Romeo and Juliet, I'm like, he got it. That's what it felt like. That is what it felt like to be in love at that age. Yeah. It was life or death. And he took it seriously. He didn't make fun of it. And I felt like Susie Hinton did the same thing. So that fact that she took it seriously unlocked it for me. I was like, I can do that. Yeah. Um, it's an intense story. I thought, I can do that. And then I think between what really elevated the production between La Jolla and Broadway was understanding that we needed to see and feel the whole thing through the character of Pony Boy. The book, that's part of the magic of the book is that you're immersed in this kid's perspective and his experience. And so every change we made between La Jolla and Broadway was in service of allowing the audience to feel the story the way Pony Boy feels it. And that's down to how the violence is staged, how the costumes look, you know, people had different costumes in La Jolla. And I really believe our costume design, I, I'm sad it didn't get the recognition I feel like it deserves because it looks simple. But what Serafina Bush did is she gave everybody one look. You know, when you remember people from your past, you remember them in this one outfit. And that's like the intention of the design. So like Cherry's in her cherry outfit. You know, they never change clothes, which is radical for a musical. That doesn't happen. Um, and so I think that that, making sure that everything traced through his eyes is what elevated everything from out of town to Broadway. Beautiful. Let's talk about the audiences that fly in from all over the world to see the musical The Outsiders and how it has touched them, especially the younger audiences, because you must meet people at stage doors or get DMs or letters or something from, <laughs> I mean, let's just talk about how this touches an audience. Anybody can start. <laughs> I'll, I'll say, um, I, I don't really, I, I said earlier, I'm an intentional artist and I am. I want people to feel to the point of transformation to bring us all closer together, you know, in love and real unity, you know. Like you're, you're a white young lady. Were you there last night? <laughs> last week. Okay, yeah. Somebody was there, somebody was there last night. Yeah, there you go. The, um, I, in all of our physical differences, I, also know how we're so similar you know and I, I can't speak to how the show impacts them but when I when I do the stage door sometimes I don't because of vocal situations or whatever and somebody from South Korea is in tears like yes. I'm going back tomorrow and you know, I don't have words for that I'm not doing the show for that for, uh, to, to, to receive anything from y'all you know uh, other than more love, you know, not love for what I do, but love as a as a black man, you know, maybe. Um, but to feel, I, I can't, I'm having a hard time articulating it. Maybe you can hear through what I'm tr attempting to share, yeah. how important it is, because that's just one person. It's been many, you know, from all over this, this country and world, and it just re-emphasizes why I do the work that I do. Yeah. And 
because it's crazy out here, you know, but at the end of the day for us to be able to do this and, and speak and exist and coexist with each other, yeah. to, to have that at the stage door, is it makes it lights my fire further. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it also just like how it's transcending language is pretty profound. Like I was in another musical on Broadway that was also a hit. And it wasn't that it didn't, it's just that the plot was hit or miss with some people because about lying to people. Yeah. Uh, and so it was like this, this story transcends and it has lasted for 60 years for a reason, you know, because it's truth. I remember uh, someone from Sony years ago when I was in the show, like six years ago, The Outsiders, they're like, this is so important because it's not often that men, masculine men, say to each other, I love you yeah. or hug each other platonically. Um, and that's what America in general is missing. The world is missing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was something that stuck with me for a long time. I can't really speak to how people are feeling. I, I you know, I mean, I, all I all I know is what I see. And, and whenever I'm able to go out to stage door, like Josh said, you know, usually I'm like, especially right now, I've, I've had to kind of chill out with it just because my voice, I get a little bit excited. Um, <laughs> But one of my favorite things is when people come up to the stage door and are teachers that teach the book. Yeah. I mean, that is just so moving to me because as uh, my mom is a first grade teacher and um, I, I feel like anywhere I've gotten in my life is, is thanks to mentors, whether they were teachers or whether they were friends that I deemed mentors. Um, you know, I, I'm really grateful for those people. And so when teachers who teach this book yeah. and it's their favorite thing to teach every single year, they're like, I, I always look forward to teaching The Outsiders. Can we please take a picture so I can show my kids back at home? Like that is always the stuff that moves me the most because I'm just like, yeah, this story is actually necessary. Yeah. And the, the fact that academia realizes that, that is a beautiful thing to me. So to be a part of something larger like that you know, a story that's being taught to kids and it's moving kids every single year. Like that, it's just very, very special. So yeah, this one goes out to all the teachers. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. And I, Dalia, go ahead. I think um, also because so many young people are coming and that's actually quite rare in Broadway right now and in the theater and it's a really good sign that young people are coming and that they want to see theater and that means they might want to do it the audience is intergenerational. So you've got a good chunk of young people and then you've got their parents and then you've got their grandparents. So you've actually got like three generations all seeing the same thing. I think because the story's universal, you've got people of different political beliefs all sitting in the same space liking the same thing, which I think is one of the most rare things right now. That you could be with somebody different from you and say, oh wow, this we're both crying, we're both laughing. Maybe we're not the opposite. Maybe there's more similar to us than different. And so I think the piece is healing. And, you know, young people that have seen it, even myself, I was having like a lot of anxiety and I came and saw the show and it made me feel better. And um, to watch it, to go to, to be with the characters. So I, I see that in the audience, you know, I feel the people collectively crying and it's a release. It's not the kind of crying that leaves you feeling bad, it kind of leaves you feeling better afterwards because you can get something out and you're not alone doing it. Yeah. One of my top five favorite feelings is crying in a theater with other people. Yeah. Um, so if you're into that, come see our show. <laughs> Bring your Kleenex. And, and I, I, I had, cause that's what I was gonna allude to at the stage door experience is, People think it's just young people outside our stage door screaming. That's not the case. Yeah. There is it's older people going crazy. And that's been the most insane, like, not insane. That's been the wildest part to me, to go from looking at a younger person's eyes and the stay gold philosophy, if you will, you know, holding on to that, that kid inside, to go from a younger person's eyes to someone who may be 20 or 30 years older than them and you see and feel the exact same thing when you go from eye to eye. This, I've never experienced anything like it. And it is a testament to the, the source material and Susie and what she put in that book. It's, it's, it's amazing, it's simply amazing. But that's what this show does. So before we leave, I just wanted there's some wonderful news about The Outsiders. It has just been announced that the national tour will launch in 2025 in Tulsa, the home of The Outsiders. Yeah. Oh. Right. 
And the original Broadway cast album was just released on Sony Master. Check it out. Go check it out. No, now, run it out, run it out, run it out, run I it out. Thank you all for taking this afternoon. I, mean, I, have, I love you guys. I love what you do. I thank you, The Outsiders, one of my favorite musicals. Go see it. The Company of thank the Outsiders. You. Thank you. Thank you.